Today I've asked Anka Thiel to um, help run this segment. Um, she's really eminently qualified and far better qualified than I would ever be for this task. She's been a leadership coach and a consultant in Silicon Valley companies for 15 plus years, coaching senior executives typically, including at Google, at Zilog, at a number of really key companies. You know, in terms of just executive coaches, you know, and sort of just spans the range of from their own personal planning, life planning, career planning, etc., and spans right into strategy issues that they're really dealing with, etc. Anka is originally from Germany, but she has lived and worked in ten countries. Um, she started her own executive coaching and leadership development practice about a dozen years ago, and has been working, as I mentioned, with you know, Google, Zilog, Cliff Bar, as well as some startup companies um, while doing her own consulting and coaching business. She also co-founded a bilingual school in the Bay Area. So she's definitely got the entrepreneurial verve. But before venturing out on her own, she learned a lot of the ropes at Bertelsmann, um, where she held a senior marketing role. And Bertelsmann, as you know, is the largest media company in Europe. She's also worked as a, as a con management consultant for Perrin, Towers Perrin. Um, she holds an MBA from UC Berkeley and a master's in psychology um, from um, Technik Universitat Darmstadt in Germany. She also serves as faculty at UC Berkeley Center for Ex Executive Education and she's certified in the Enneagram, of course. Um, she lives in Berkeley with her husband and two kids, as well as a cat, and some cats, I guess. <laughs> so it's a pleasure introducing Anka. So uh, let's dive right into it and tell you what we're going to do and what's in it for you. And maybe let's start with what's in it for you. So what I hope at the end of this segment, we may actually go all the way till lunch, is that you're going to achieve three things. First is gain insight or more self-awareness around what your behavioral preferences and patterns are, a little bit in general, but then more specific related to failing or succeeding. So you're going to learn hopefully a little bit more about your core motivations, your fears, some of your coping mechanism, coping strategies. And secondly, I want you to think differently, not just about yourself, but also about others and how you interact with others. And from my own experience, and also as Ellie shared, the Enneagram is a, an amazing tool to really give you a deep insight into what makes another person tick. It goes deeper than other systems. So I hope that at the end of this segment, you look at people a little bit more compassionately or tolerantly, more understanding, okay? And last but not least, I want you to feel encouraged and inspired that despite any maybe future failures, you're going to have tools available that um, help you to keep pursuing your dreams. Okay? Sounds good? Good. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on three questions related to failure. The first one is, why are we afraid of failure? The second one, how can we redefine failure and start to embrace it more? And the third one, how can we process, bounce back, and learn and grow from failure? And we will have lots of reflections, discussions, exercises within all those three parts. In between those three parts, we'll have something special for you. We have first an Enneagram panel, and we'll need some volunteers. So maybe you can already get uh, ready and think about whether you want to do it. We want to have one person of each type come up here, and we're going to have you share from your own experience what is it like to be that type. And then the second thing we're going to do is, in between the segments, we're going to pair you up with another type. And hopefully you will slip into this other person's mind uh, and see things from a different perspective. And also try out, now that I know maybe a little bit more about that person, how may I interact differently with them. And last but not least, we're going to have Delvin up here, another guest speaker that actually Ellie is going to introduce probably later. Uh, but Delvin used to be a 
a professional athlete, a football player, and I don't know anything about football, <laughs> but he played on the 49ers and other teams. And we thought he's going to share a unique perspective, not just from his personality view, being a certain Enneagram type, but also having been a professional athlete and how he's dealt with failing and succeeding kind of on a repetitive basis. Okay. Good, so that's the plan for this. So we're going to start with um, the first question, why are we afraid of failure? So the four letter F word, fear, seems to go hand in hand with failure. But what are we afraid of? And are we afraid of all, everybody the same thing or is it different for each of us? And how does fear of failure operate in our life? So we want to look at those things. And we want to actually get you warmed up uh, we're going to do a little exercise. Um, anybody heard of the repeating question or the inquiry method from the diamond heart approach? Nope. So this may be a little bit weird, <laughs> but this exercise is meant to get you into a reflective mode, to become present, to listen to the other person, and hopefully to learn something about your fears and the other person's fears. Okay? So if you feel it's, it's weird and awkward, just hang in there. Okay? Good, and we thought since it's different, Ellie and I, we're going to demonstrate. Ellie, are you okay with that? You got it. Good, great. <laughs> so what we're going to do is, um, we will, I mean, first of all, we have to decide, you have to decide, then who's going to start out being the listener and the speaker, right? And there are two questions you can choose from, only one. So either you're going to talk with your partner about why you're afraid of failure, or you pick the second one, how does fear of failure operate in your life? We want to demonstrate both, which is thought it's going to be interesting to hear from us, you know, around those topics. So first... I just realized, by the way, I just heard about this about five minutes ago, so I'm not prepared. And that is great, That's actually. The That's the whole point. So we don't want you to censor your answers. Again, the idea is by repeatedly asking the questions, no matter how dumb that is, 10 times, 15 times, you get about 90 seconds, we'll time you. You get to deeper layers, right? And you don't think about it. It's just whatever comes out. So in order to do this effectively, we have to first become present, right? And the way we do it, and I invite you, you can also now already do this with us, is by just bringing your attention inside. And maybe you start by taking several deeper breaths and you feel your feet on the floor. And you notice sensations you have in your feet without judging. So it's a way of centering us and arriving here, okay? And then, Ellie, if it's okay, then I'll start you. I'll start asking you, okay? And I'm not going to comment on anything what he says. It's not a conversation that we're going to have. I'm just going to say thank you every time he says something, okay? And we'll do it a little bit shorter. So, Ellie, why are you afraid of failure? Because it hurts. Thank you. Why are you afraid of failure? I've been there. It's very, it can be very, very painful. It can be very isolating and scary. Thank you. Why are you afraid of failure? Makes me alone. Makes me, makes me desperate. Thank you. Ali, why are you afraid of failure? Because I don't want to be seen as, as a failure. I don't want to be seen as not worthy. Thank you. Okay, we can switch. Let you get you off the hook. <laughs> and you're welcome. You can ask me the same question before we demonstrate the other one, okay? And so if we change, we want to center ourselves again. Just feel your feet on the floor, bring your attention in and down, and keep breathing. Anka, why are you afraid of failure? Uh, it's painful. It, it sucks to get stuck in it. Thank you. Why are you afraid of failure? Um, I'm worried how other people are going to perceive me. Thank you, Monica. Why are you afraid of failure? 
I think I may not have the same opportunities after I failed. You know, it's, uh, there are going to be consequences that may be limiting. Yeah. Thank you. Why are you afraid of failure? Yeah, I've been there too. Um, it's not pleasant. Um, yeah, and it, I think it takes away from my energy to move forward, to get stuff done. Yeah. Okay, so maybe we can go to the next question and we switch again. Okay, again, remember, we want you to do only one. So think about either the first one or the second one. Okay, we just recenter again. So Ellie, how does fear of failure operate in your life? It can, um, it can freeze me from action. Thank you. How does fear of failure operate in your life? It's almost as bad as the failure itself, but it's scarier because you're just processing mm. thoughts. Thank you. How does fear of failure operate in your life? Hugely. Hugely. Um, keeps me running. So maybe there's a good thing about it. Mm. Thank you. Okay, so now we can switch. Anka, how does fear of failure operate in your life? Um, for now, I would say I overprepare a lot, which is a good thing, right? Because it, I think it prevents me from failing, but then clearly I can overdo it and where it gets me into trouble with mostly managing my time and I think then the consequences for the people around me, particularly my loved ones. Thank you, Anka. How does fear of failure operate in your life? Um, yeah, so it's, par I mean, it's partly, it's a good thing, more than it used to be when I was younger. I think it also, it prevented me from doing certain things because the fear was more paralyzing. <coughs> How does fear of failure operate in your life? Um, it's actually there a lot. I think if I kind of like really look closely, it, it's there a lot, kind of as a, almost like a motivation. As you said, it, it's positive and, and negative, but it's there a lot more than I would want to admit. Thank you. Okay, good. So you get the idea? Okay, so there are nine types. Right? But there's a lot uh, more, there's more complexity within the Enneagram because you have wings and you have subtypes and you have integration and disintegration points. We're not going to go all there. We're going to stick with the nine types. That's enough right, for today. But I want to say it's not about boxing you into any of those categories or labels. Um, and also when you decide to take on the Enneagram and learn more and use it in working with people, don't label people. I mean, that's true for any personality system. I think that's a misuse of any system, right? You want to say, oh, you are a six, you know, and you have those issues, or you're an eight. <laughs> Refrain from that. So anything I'm going to say here is really meant that there, there's not supposed to be any bias. If you feel I'm, it sounds judgmental, you know, I'm favoring a type, please let me know, OK? So it's a tool that gives you in-depth insight not just about your, your behavioral patterns and preferences, but it goes deeper. Your motivations, your fears, your coping strategies. And because of that, it's a great tool to learn more about yourself, become more aware, start on the path of self-discovery and self-development. So it starts with becoming more aware of your automatic patterns, see yourself in action, and hopefully you'll have a chance to do this when we pair you up today. And then you can start to loosen a little bit and try something that's outside of your pattern, okay? And I think as Ellie pointed to, another powerful use is if you use it working with others, right? If you understand yourself better, you, and you also work on understanding others better, to see what their motivations are, what are their you know, fears and concerns, you can become more understanding. And you can also start to flex your own style, right? So it's a tool that can help you become more impactful more influential, right? It can, you know, help you like avoid miscommunications. Um, 
So very powerful tool. And we want to have you try that out later. So let's see. So the Enneagram, as I said, goes deeper than other systems, Maya's bricks, also called the MBTI, you may have taken this insights discovery. They typically stay at the surface. They describe behavior. Now the Enneagram looks, you see the iceberg representing the human psyche, goes deeper and looks what's underneath. The Enneagram assumes that there is a core woundedness for each type. No worries, we're not going to go into that today. <laughs> but based on that, what we're going to talk about is the core motivation. And that's really key. If you get that for each of the types, wow, you've come a long way, right? You really get a person and see them differently. <coughs> so then whenever these type-specific motivations or needs are not being met, again, same thing, anxiety and fears come up. So we're going to talk about the type-specific fears. And typically then, when anxiety and fears come up, your defense mechanisms kick in. <coughs> So we're going to focus on motivations, on fears. We look a little bit at the behavioral level, and we're also going to talk about the focus of attention that each type has, right? So the way you look at the world. So here are the nine types. You're familiar probably now with, uh, with the, the symbol, the circle. Um, and I want uh, you to quickly, relatively quickly, quickly walk you through each of the types. Right? Um, so each type has a specific worldview. It's like a filter through which they perceive the world. Right? And that determines the type's thinking, feeling, and acting, behaving. These are just labels, again, and you see that in the report they use different ones. In the handouts you get later they also have different descriptions, so don't get confused. You know, you can call each type something different, but again, it's just a label. <coughs> so again, there is no type that's better than another one. Each type has its specific strength, blind spots, and development areas. So let's start with a perfectionist. And who uh, got identified as a one? So we had one person. Somebody else? I think we had another person, actually. I think we had two ones, but then, <coughs> excuse me, the person is uh, probably not here. Uh, so the perfectionist, yeah, you are one too? Great, okay. <laughs> so the perfectionists are also called the reformer. Um, they are realistic and they are responsible. They have high standards for themselves and for others. And they want to do things right. And they, can, they, they, they control themselves in order to do this. Right? So the two of you who got identified as a one, would you, does that resonate the description? What would you add? Okay, good. So let's move on. Type two, the helper, the giver. But you see there is a connection between the two and the eight, right? So, and it's, uh, and we can, we're not going to go too much into this, but this is the uh, stress point. Um, so you may actually show behavior of the eight, which is the controller um, or the, uh, the protector, and that you become a lot more impatient and intolerant. So maybe under stress, you show this behavior. But it could also be that actually you are an eight, and this is like your point of integration. So that's something to, to check out, right? So as an eight, who typically has a lot of energy and power and control, that when you're at ease and relax, you show behavior of the two. Okay? Good. So uh, any, anything else on the two? Or can we move on to the three? Good. So the three, the performer or the competitive achiever, uh, they are high energy. They are outgoing, they're active and fast-paced, and they are goal-oriented, task-oriented. Right? I would say you'll have a chance when we pair you up with another person to observe your patterns life in action, right? How you start a conversation, what do you focus on, what kind of feelings come up, you know? So pay attention to that. Good. Anything else on the three? Then let's move on to the four, okay? Great. So the four is called the romantic or in the um, report they call them the, uh, what, the intense creative or the idealist. Um, they are deeply into their feelings. They are highly perceptive. Right? Often they have a creative disposition. They are empathic. Right? And they, often they long for an ideal. They look for meaning, for depth. Right? So maybe you can tune your awareness to that when you share something. I mean, your type also influences your communication style. 
right? Thank you. Okay, so moving on, the five, the observer, in the report they call them the quiet specialist. So for them it's important to be knowledgeable and self-sufficient. So knowledgeable, being self-sufficient, they are concerned about conserving energy. So then they detach a little bit and they observe what's going on. But they are really good at this. So question, does the Enneagram type change? Well, it's assumed really not, kind of like you come into the world with a predisposition and then it's your life experiences who shape you in this specific type and whether you have a wing in something. Um, what could have been different is that, assuming that you got the type right, and there is always the potential you know, for mistyping, that maybe either you were in a less stressful situation, you know, or in a more stressful situation, uh, which can then kick you into either your, you know, integration uh, or your stress point, right? So the stress point for the five is the seven. So it's then when they kind of like, they become a little bit frantic, you know, and um, they feel like they're actually giving like too much energy away, right? And with uh, the integration point is you go to the eight. You're, so you come a little bit out of your shell, right? So maybe that's something to explore, right? But typically it's assumed like you don't change the Enneagram, Enneagram type. So, but as you develop and mature, you start to integrate the positive aspects of the other types, okay? Good, so six, loyal skeptic, good. So the loyal skeptic, I think it was called the, uh, let's see, the questioner. So they are loyal. They are responsible and trustworthy and caring, right? And they ask a lot of questions typically. They are curious. They are also in the thinking triad. Hmm? What I want to say with the six, what's special about the six is that unlike the other types, we have two subtypes. There is a phobic and a counterphobic six. These are horrible words, right? But it just means that because fear is the core emotion of this type, uh, the phobic deals differently with the counterphobic. The, uh, the phobic six is typically a little bit more timid, you know, careful, and maybe paralyzed by the fear, whereas the counterphobic is more outgoing and goes into the fear. It's almost as they don't notice that there is the fear, and they are more risk-loving. Good, so moving on, the seven. And now we have a lot of seven energy here in the room, right? <laughs> well, actually, uh, there must be some missing. I don't know, we had seven or so. And Ellie and myself, we are also seven. So clearly there's gonna be a bias, you know, <laughs> in this whole segment here. Not in terms of thinking about the types, but in, in terms of how we put this together, right? It, it's again, like our personality shows up. So the seven called the Epicure Enthusiast, uh, in the report it was called the Enthusiastic Visionary. Uh, they're energetic, optimistic, upbeat. Uh, you know, they look at like all the opportunities out there. Um, what else would you say? Charming, spontaneous, adventurous. Hmm? We want to have a lot of fun. Yeah, we want to have a lot of fun. <laughs> at the expense of a few things, so we'll talk about this. So what, what resonated with you guys? Oh, then we have the two sevens here too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we got a few, I was surprised actually at how many eights we had. Uh, so the protector, or the challenger, they are justice and fairness seeking, right? They care about justice and fairness. And they want to be strong, they want to be in control. And often you uh, recognize them at their energy, at their presence. They get in a room and they have this energy, they don't even have to open their mouth. They have a presence, just a physical presence. So they are kind of like take action, command, and often people come to them, they have a natural leadership thing, right? Does that resonate with you guys? You're gonna give me a hard time, you're gonna challenge me, I know. <laughs> okay, good, so last one, mediator. Peacemaker, okay. So the mediator, the peacemaker, they are all about others. They are so good at blending in. Right? And they like the two, they actually look similar to the two. They have this ability to tune into others. And they want to know what's, what's the other person's agenda or their perspective. So that's why they're called the mediators, because they can slip into these different per perspectives. They're very supportive, you know, friendly. They want to be loved by everybody, right? And make contact. Yeah? Good. And they're easygoing. They won't give you a hard time. Uh, 
Okay, so these are the nine types. Now we're going to look at the core motivations of each type, and then we look at um, the focus of attention, how you view the world, and the fears. Okay, okay, good. So now let's take a look at the each type's core motivation. So I want you to go back to your own type and see, can you identify with that? Yeah, okay, good, okay, thanks. Okay, so go back to your uh, core motivation of your type. Uh, does that resonate? We already heard from a few before. Well, now the thing is, if you look at those, you could say, well, I can identify with all of those, right? So who would not want to do things right or be helpful and generous? But the difference is, if you look at your core motivation, it's like life and death, right? So it's really, and if you looked consciously at how you move around in the world and behave, you would actually see, as somebody had mentioned before, the core motivation shine through, or be behind that, almost every behavior, okay? Good, so um, the core motivation is gonna influence or determine how you see the world. So, quick thing, here are the nine types, I don't know, is that big enough, can you see, read that? So the nine personalities before the dinner party, you see the types in this little thing here. One, two, three, so take a look. You know, this is people's world. What are they thinking about? Again, you see, like it goes back to the core motivation. Do you see yourself in there? <laughs> Okay, enough time? <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, so let's move on to the next one. Everybody read through the whole thing? Good. So now actually let's take a look at the focus of attention for each type. So we heard from the one, what's right, what's wrong, goes back to this core motivation of doing things right. Right? So just think about what's good about having this attentional focus. What's good about that? If you, for anybody, if you walk around thinking about um, caring also, doing things right, and you look at like, you look at here, maybe you see what's right, what's not, right, what's orderly. Hmm? What's good about that? You can fix it if it's broken. Yes, you can fix it if it's broken. What's not so good about it? What's the potentially a negative thing of this attentional style? So it's critical, judgmental. Okay, good. The two, oh, sorry, you want? I was gonna say you could be wrong about your assessment of that. No, the one is never wrong. <laughs> Just kidding. No, could be, exactly, could be wrong. So the two uh, wants to be generous and, and helpful, right? So they care about others' needs. What's good about that style? Yeah, totally, they are tuned in, right? They care, they deeply care and connect with others. What's potentially not so good? What's the negative side? Can lose themselves in others' needs. Exactly, right. They forget about themselves, self-care, good. The three, motivated by being productive, successful, their attention goes to tasks and goals. What's good about that? <laughs> They're active, they get stuff done, right? They go into a meeting and say, okay, here's the agenda. Today we gotta do one, two, three. <laughs> What's not so good about that? <laughs> you may have to adjust, and maybe they are too rigid to do that, okay. What else? And they forget about the relationship. And other styles, maybe they want to just have a minute to connect, to check in, have some small talk, right? So again, watch that tendency when you pair up and have the conversations later. How you start this conversation, and what like the other type prefers, okay? So the four, we said the four, um, they are about uh, feeling deeply. 
And so they have these ideals. They go back to the past and the future. So they identify what's missing, right? What's good about that attentional style? Yeah, they go deep, they look for the meaning. What's not so good? We already heard a little bit about this, right? It's kind of the negative, maybe half class empty, and you may be more in the, in the future or the present and not in the uh, future or past, but not in the present, right? So the five was concerned about conserving energy, accumulating knowledge. So their attention goes to kind of like what's intruding potentially. I want to keep that out, right? And they detach to observe. What's good about that? We heard, I think, uh, you're very observing, right? And what's not so good about it? We tend to go more abstract and less concrete. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. We, we tend to come across as a person who is uh, not so warm, who mm. wants to be isolated, who is not so easily mixing with other people. Yeah, so because maybe the feeling side is left out, right? So warmth. Okay, good. So the six uh, attention, or the core motivation is to be safe and to belong. So their attention goes to, ooh, what could go wrong, right? What are the hazards? And they are into worst case scenarios. What's good about that attentional style? Yeah, but you've thought through this. In case it happens, maybe 90% of the time it's not going to happen, but then you would be prepared, yeah. right? And you've processed that, yeah. okay? Yeah. What's not so good about that, the attentional style? What's the flip side? Yeah, it takes you away from the moment, and you're kind of like vigilant all the time. So it's almost you're stressing yourself right, and activate certain parts of your nervous system or your limbic system, yeah. Okay, uh, so the seven, <coughs> we heard core motivation is to maximize experiences, stay away from pain, so they look for pleasant options for what's out there, what's fun. What's good about this attentional style? They also, they identify ideas, you know, what's fun, ideas, options. What, what's good about that style? They want to be free and have fun, and that comes across, so maybe that's contagious, others pick up on that, upbeat energy, right? And they can see ideas and connect them, right? You, yeah. I was just going to say positive, so they're not dwelling yeah. on that feeling or anything. Yeah, so what's not good about that? And then we sevens, we have to ask ourselves that question and remember that, right? Just to add another yeah. positive. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very good on vision. Yes, great. So that's the, the mental activity, connecting the stuff, looking out there. Exactly. What, what's, <laughs> who would say something about the negative side of this attentional style? Well, just touching on that, seeing the vision, like, or looking into the future and actually thinking, okay, this is going to be possible. Other people might not really be able to connect with your vision because mm. you're so far away into the future. You have that vision where mm. other people will just look at you and say, what are you talking about? This is yeah. not achievable. This is not possible. How do you want to get there? So they won't be able to really connect with you and your ideas. Yeah, so they are not that... Uh, positive or far out, outward looking, mm -hmm. and maybe also they are not that quite that fast, right? Mm -hmm. That they get there it may take them a little bit longer. Okay. <coughs> they can be a little too happy go lucky. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> there is a too much of everything, even of the positivity. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, um, I think a lot of times sevens will get really excited about something, and you're like very optimistic, and you think you can do everything. So you'll just jump into something without really like reflecting me. Yeah, maybe you're not critical enough. Uh, you just go yeah. and like, we can do this. I don't care. I'm just running forward. But yeah. probably yeah. maybe a little too risk-taking. Mm. Okay. 
Good, so moving on to the eight. So the eight, they want to be strong and control, you know, so their attention goes to power, who's in, in, in charge here, you know, or am I controlling things? And uh, they look for justice and fairness. Uh, what's the positive side of this attentional style? What's good about that? <laughs> what? <laughs> Nothing about that? But that's really, that's the problem. I mean, like yeah. you and I sometimes will put myself in a situation that I shouldn't be in because I want to act as an advocate for someone that I shouldn't have to or shouldn't. That's not mm. my And that's, you know, learning to have the humility to not put myself in that kind of situation. But it does, when you have such a strong uh, personality, it's kind okay. of hard not to want to be an advocate all the time. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it's sometimes even when you're acting in, in the best of your intentions, you can easily bulldoze. Right. Uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I think that's the biggest problem. Right. Is, yeah. is understanding the limit of how far you should go and how how effective what you are doing is actually being, and, and how much you're not giving others the the possibility of doing it themselves. Okay, great. So, I, and uh, I love this. Uh, you guys bring that up. Actually, the negative side as an eight, right? Where you actually want to be strong, but you look at this and reflect on it and say it could be too much, and it could get in the way of others maybe also rising up, you know, and and taking charge. But the good thing is that you guys take charge if it's needed, right? There's somebody there, right? Yeah, but I think also, I'm speaking from a very uh, personal perspective, perhaps, uh, being the mother of two children. Um, sometimes, let's say, in dividing tasks with my husband, I will take charge too much mm. and not necessarily give him the space to be able to do things the way he would, which might not be the way that I would do them, but they are just as effective. So, yeah. Know, yeah. Yeah. So I think it's it's that constant balance, and it's very hard, and it takes a lot of energy in you know constantly stepping out and looking at the picture and saying, don't don't do don't overstep. Mm. You actually realize that you probably already have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you. <laughs> so you take advantage. <laughs> well, you flip it around. You step back. Ah, uh, you assign the task. Okay. And that's. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, that, that's actually interesting. So it kind of like it sounds the eight, you, you assign the task. It could be you step back, you go into the five where you more withdraw. <laughs> okay, so and lastly, the, we have the nine. Uh, again, their uh, core motivation is to maintain harmony and peace. So their focus of attention goes to other people's agenda. What's good about that, of course, as we had mentioned this, they are good at putting themselves into other people's perspective. And I think we also heard similar to the two, they can lose themselves, right? Because they forget about, hey, I'm here, what do I want? They may have a hard time identifying what they want and need, what their preferences are. Okay, so now let's take a look at what are the core fears. Just read through this and see whether that makes sense and whether there is any connection with the fears you talked about before in this repeating exercise, uh, repeating question exercise. Okay, so going back to your core fear and think back to the repeating question exercise, the fears that you shared. Are those aligned? Does it ring a bell? Hmm? It does? Anybody want to comment on that? Uh, yeah. I'm a seven and what I found interesting I identify with that core fear, but then shooting over to the one, I think that's also one of my top fears is being so bad or wrong that unworthy. Um, yeah. So that's the connection of the seven to the one to this stress point. Yeah, good. 
Do others see that also? That maybe given your type and the connection to the stress point disintegration, that this is a, uh, another core fear you can resonate with? Okay, good. So thanks for stepping uh, fully into this, you know, material and being so engaged. Uh, so that, you know, covered the first part, why are we afraid of failure? So coming with this back to our first question. And now actually we want to, um, oh no, actually here, sorry, we have, now you see the nine personalities after the dinner party. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. Not like that. The eight. Okay. Okay. The seven is still out. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so now we got to move um, to our second part since we addressed the first question, why are we afraid of failure? And the second question is, how can we redefine failure and start to embrace it more? But what do we mean by embrace failure more? We definitely don't want you to fail more often or to start behaving recklessly or to lower your standards. So what do we mean by that? We mean just that you're going to get a different perspective and see failing as part of the human experience and that you can actually take something positive out of it. Okay? Did you, uh, yesterday or before, I know, define what failure means? Did you guys talk about that? Definition of failure? Not per se. Okay. Good. So um, I always like to start, you know, from scratch and go back and, you know, I looked up the word in the dictionary. So this is the traditional definition of failure. It's usually defined as the opposite of success and also as uh, not having acted or performed as expected or required by another person or yourself. And I thought the interesting thing about the second part is that it points us to two causes of failure. Right? If you think inaction right, um, or uh, not acting yeah, as, as required or performed. And the two causes of failure are one is to quit when the going gets tough. So when obstacles show up and get in the way and you give up. You say that's it. Failed one, once and then you give up. So that would be one cause of failure because you don't keep going. And the other one is um, to procrastinate, become indecisive, right? And not maybe take the chance, take the opportunity that's there, okay? So two causes of failure. Let's take a look at the flip side, success. And how do we define success? Did you guys talk about that, definition of success? Anybody has a personal definition of success? You want to share? Good. So um, I've coached at Google uh, for about four years, and I work with young folks like you guys. So smart, ambitious people in their mid-20s. They are right out of college. And mostly I work with uh, product managers, associate product managers, and asso associate product marketing managers. In working with them, I noticed that often they want to know, and maybe that's part of this generation, that you guys want to know, what's my purpose in life? You know, what I meant to do and how do I define success? So I've been playing with that for a while and uh, came up with a generic definition or found one. I didn't create this. A generic definition of success that seems to work for folks. And here it is. So you're succeeding as long as you're happy, you're having an impact in the world, and you're growing and learning. Okay? So that's generic enough. So, but you may then ask, so, but how do you define happiness? Right? So here we have another equation. I love equations. So happiness is defined as your personal set point. And again, that has something to do with your Enneagram type. That's kind of like your outlook in the, into the world, how positive or negative. Right? So maybe the type six, maybe the type one, maybe has more of a negative outlook. Right? The seven, clearly, we heard that repeatedly, has more of a positive outlook. But there are other types as well, right? The two and the nine. But it's not set in stone. 
right? With all the positive uh, psychology, we know we can work on that. There are many tools that are available to get our set point a little bit higher if we have this natural tendency to look at things more from the negative side. And also the four, as you guys pointed it out, would probably have a lower set point. So then the circumstances or the conditions of life, and this is more about the traditional stuff when you think of being successful, the title, the amount of money you make, like the size of your apartment or your house and the car, right? So that's the conditions of life, the circumstances. And the third one is your intentional activities. So that means whether what you do is aligned with what you care about, with your values, right? So that's something to think about. If you actually, in life, do more what you really care about, what is aligned with your values, you're going to be happier. Okay? And here is how each variable contributes to your overall happiness. And you will see surprisingly, the circumstances, what we typically think of in success, the money and the title, does, is not that important. It's 10% the circumstances. But the set point, how you look at life is key, and then whether what you do is aligned with what you care about. Okay? So if you don't have a personal definition of success yet, I would invite you over the next couple of weeks or months, take some time, sit down, think about, start with the, the values, kind of like that would tell you what you want to do more of, right? And there are different ways to do this, you know, go out there, value exercises, maybe you've already done some of those, you know. Also the Enneagram is going to tell you about that. Uh, so it can be a useful exercise, okay? So now, did you have a question or? No, good. So now if we take all this into account and take it back to a new definition of failure, we can say as long as you keep learning and growing, you're not failing. But the moment you stop learning and growing, yes, then you would be failing, okay? Good, thoughts, comments on that part? Uh, this is a wonderful book, David Daniels, who we studied with, and Helen Palmer. They created a specific tradition that we got, got trained in. Uh, it, it, it's the best like, reference book. It's like each type is described in like four pages, or even the essence in two pages. It's great. If you're interested in taking this into the work context, Ginger Lapid Bogda, she has lots of books there. Go and visit her website. This is really great in terms of how you bring that into the work world. And this is just one of like maybe four books she has, right? And this is a fun one, the Enneagram Made Easy, that has you know graphics, made, made, makes it really easy to understand like the ones you saw about the dinner party, okay?